Okay. Welcome to Fossil Creek Tree Farm and Nursery. I'm, I'm Max. I'll be your uh, garden coach today, and we're going to talk about planting a tree. And, of course, the first thing is, people ask is, when's the best time to plant a tree? Well, the Chinese had an answer 20 years ago. And if you didn't do that, well, today, as soon as possible. You know, the uh, approach to landscaping uh, your yard around your house is big things first. And trees are one of the biggest things. So uh, get them started. And instead of thinking, well, should I or shouldn't I or what should I do? And then a year down the road, you know, you're getting around to it. Well, you just lost a year that that tree could be in the ground. So, uh, of course, the first thing then after that is I'm going to plant a tree. Uh, pick the tree. Well, shade is not really an optional thing in North Texas. So if you're looking for a shade tree, uh, we've got plenty of them. Uh, red oak, live oak, bur oak, chinkapin, Chinese pistache, ball cypress. They'll all be uh, neat shade trees. But uh, to really investigate it, we're lucky that now we have plenty of reference materials from different authors from the area. Of course, this is one of our most popular books, Easy Gardens in North Central Texas, and even has a map on the back showing the counties we're talking about. You know, we're right in there. Uh, Steve Huddleston is one of the co-authors. He was a, a director of the Fort Worth Botanical Gardens. So this is especially informative and uh, local. And then, of course, Howard Garrett has a book, Texas Trees, obviously applies to us. And then, of course, Neil Sperry's uh, Lone Star Gardening. You know, all of these are very informative, can do a great job of helping you decide on which tree that you want to do. And then after you've decided on it, um, after kind of looking over the information on the the uh, trees, and then uh, having an assessment of your yard, uh, then you're going to want to, the next question is, how do I place it? So on a lot of these trees, if you look in the reference materials, or if you just look around the neighborhoods or places where you see more mature ones, you'll get an idea of how big they are. So some of them, like a, a red oak, it could, it could get as much as uh, 50 feet wide. So if you're out in your yard, <clears throat> the way you figure what kind of space is that, if it's 50 feet wide, that means if you're standing where the trunk is going to be, it's 25 feet in every direction. So you could just, you know, you could put a hose out there or you could do a, a string and kind of do a, a circle to give you an idea of how far it's going to reach because you want to uh, pick the tree according to the space that you've got and what you're wanting it to do. And of course that brings up part of the benefits. I mentioned, you know, shade is a, a great benefit. So placement of the tree is also going to involve, you know, if it's on, on the west side of your house, you know, it's going to save you on your utilities. Or if it's you're going to be planting and you're going to have a patio around it, and you want there to be shade, uh, you're going to do that. And of course, this might require you to get out there on your day off when you're working in the yard. Notice the path of the sun, uh, taking into account what time of the year it is. When we're in the summer, it's going to be going directly overhead. Now that we're going into the fall toward the winter, you know, it's down toward the south. So. Uh, if you, for instance, if you had a uh, red oak, like I do on the west side of my house, where my patio is, it would shade the patio and the house. I put it on the west side. And the neat thing about it is, and, and somewhat to the southwest, the neat thing about uh, that particular tree is, when it loses its leaves in the, in the fall, then at that time of year, you're more inclined to want the sun and the warmth to come through. So it'll lose its leaves, the sun's in the south, and the sun still gets through. 
if you were to plant a uh, live oak in the fall and winter, everything north of a live oak is cold storage. Since the sun is low on the horizon in the winter, if you had a red oak in full foliage, anything to the north of it, it's never going to see sunlight. So it's going to be awfully chilly through the winter. So if you were trying to decide, should I do a red oak or a live oak, it's going to be south of my patio. I'd probably do a red oak just because on the short winter days that tend to be cooler, I'd want the light and the heat to come through in the winter. Uh, and the, the uh, live oak, uh, you could have it further away from the house and it wouldn't bother. Just keep in mind, it's going to be cool uh, north of a, of a live oak. Okay. And now we'll get into planting it. First of all, before you plant anything, uh, this is a generalization. You can put this one in the bank. Before you start to plant it, I don't care if you're planting a tree, a shrub, or a pot with annuals or whatever, whatever you're going to be planting, the first step is water it. And then you can start digging the hole. Because when you get finished, for instance, uh, planting a tree, be a good idea to put some root stimulator on it. You don't want to put root stimulator on a plant that's really needing a drink. And you don't know necessarily, does it really need a drink or not? If you water it before you start digging the hole, it's had a drink and you know it's ready to go. And once you get it in there and planted, by then you know it's hydrated and you can apply your first treatment of root stimulator and it'll be good to go. Um, and if it was something else, say you were planting a pot, then you're using a water-soluble fertilizer. Once you get it planted, you know it's going to be good to go because you watered it before you got started. Uh, okay, as far as planting, uh, you've watered your, your tree. Now you're going to start digging the hole. Uh, you're going to want to dig it the depth of your root ball. And of course, in, you can see in this container that the root ball comes up to right about here. So you won't necessarily, don't necessarily dig at the depth of your container because the top of the root ball is not typically not right at the top. So you, uh, of course, you've watered your plant. You're digging your hole. You're getting close to the depth. So at that point, uh, without trees overhead interfering. You can, you know, pull your container off. There you go. As you're getting close to the right depth, you've got an empty container. If you're planting a tree, you know, it could be a 30 gallon tree this is a 15 gallon pot. Of course, a 30 gallon, twice as much volume. It's going to be about uh, 20 to 22 inches across and 18 to 20 inches deep on your root ball. So that's going to be relatively heavy. Uh, you might, on a bigger tree like that, you might actually have to uh, cut the side of the container. Usually, once we'll do it. You just come to a drainage hole and just pull up and cut the container to where you can peel it away. Be easy to get the root ball out. When you get it out, uh, you can put it to the side and you've got an empty container to work with. Well, why would I say that? Well, as you approach the right depth of the, of the uh, hole, you can use the empty container. The soil ball comes up to here. And you're digging it about the width of the, con the container. You can set your container down in the hole to test are you, are you at the right depth. And see right there, you can, if this is the edge of the hole, you put it down to that lip, that's where the root ball top is. Well, now you know. Now, the other way you could do it, you could lift the tree in. 
set it down, and then you would find out you still had two inches to go, at which point you have to lift the big heavy tree back out and dig some more. And if you're unlucky, you might have to do that twice, you know. It's much easier to do it with a light can. Then you know you've got it right to the right depth. Then you can dig the hole wider. <clears throat> Typically, uh, you'd want it at least a hand length wider all the way around. But once you've got the hole dug to the size of your root ball, then you can expand it and dig around and uh, you don't have anything in the way. Then you have it to the right depth. This guy, you can see the roots, the light things. That means they're alive and active. You know, you can, you know, the, the teasing, that'll kind of fluff the roots out to where they're, they're ready to go out into the surrounding soil. You know, I would also loosen up the, bot the bottom a little bit. And, of course, this is a five-gallon apricot tree, so it's kind of relatively easy. If you're doing a 30-gallon, you might have to be a little more intense. You might want to wear some gloves, but you want to loosen the roots around the side and the bottom. <clears throat> and then you set, the, set that one in there, and you're going to... Fill back in with your existing soil. If it's a, a, a small tree or ornamental tree or a big specimen shrub, uh, you, could, you could amend the soil somewhat. If it's a big tree, it's going to be growing in the existing soil. So you uh, And even if you amended the soil, you're going to be on a smaller tree or ornamental item. You're still going to be using mostly the... Uh, uh, original soil that came out. You can mix the little planting mix in it, but uh, if it's a big tree, uh, that's not really uh, necessary. You can use some, and of course the soil you dig out, when you dig it out around here, it's typically clay, so it could be in big chunks of clay. Well, chop that up with your shovel before you put it back in. Don't put big chunks of sticky clay back in. You want to slice it up with your shovel, and then as you're putting it in, if you once you get it about halfway in, use your hose to water it and to help settle the soil. And um, you don't want to stomp it down or whatever. The, the water will make it settle pretty well. And then you add the rest of your soil, water it to get it to settle. And at that point, uh, you could use your uh, root stimulator, and this is a uh, concentrate. You'd use three and a half tablespoons per gallon, and it will um, stimulate the roots to form uh, smaller feeder roots, and that's what's going to sustain uh, the tree and help put on growth. Uh, and then on top, once you get it in there, you want to mulch the top. You know, this is a native hardwood mulch. You could do uh, cedar mulch. We also have colored mulches. They all function as a mulch. Uh, I kind of like the uh, native hardwood because it kind of breaks down and adds to the mulch. You'll probably need to replenish it at least uh, once a year. I'd put probably about a couple inches of mulch. And the key thing is uh, when you, uh, I've talked about the right level, you want the existing grade to be pretty close to what it was to begin with on the tree. You might have it a tiny bit higher but uh, certainly you don't want it lower. And then when you mulch, that'll help cover that. And you don't want any of it up against the trunk of the tree. This is another generalization time. <clears throat> Back to <clears throat> from bedding plants or herbs or shrubs, whatever. Uh, the trunk of the tree where it goes into the soil or the stem, whatever. 
that's for air circulation. You don't want any mulch up against the trunk. Uh, you want air circulation and you want that to uh, have remain dry and uh, have good air circular, circulation around it. The mulch will be from there out. You want it over the roots, not up against the trunk. And over the roots and where you, the soil that you've loosened and further out, uh, I typically want, you know, depending on the size of the tree, even on a little fruit tree, I'd want it to be three feet across, four feet would still be okay, and you're not going to have uh, grass around there. If you see a tree in a yard and it has grass growing right up against it, it's a scary thing. If, if uh, you happen to hire a uh, lawn service and they come out to uh, trim around uh, weeds and grass and whatever, if you've got grass growing up to the trunk of your tree, uh, it's a great danger that the person with that could damage the trunk of the tree. If there's mulch, they're not tempted to come close to the tree trunk with a trimmer. So you have the mulch three or four feet out, and under that, uh, remove the grass. Uh, it's really important on things like fruit trees because typically our grass around here is Bermuda. It's a heavy feeder, very competitive, uh, not a good neighbor for freshly planted trees. So uh, it'll compete for water and, and uh, uh, fertility you know, that's in the soil. So remove it and put mulch. The other thing that the mulch does, it insulates from uh, the temperatures around here. Typically, cold is not a big deal. Heat's more of a concern because when full sun's sh shining down on the soil, it can get pretty ferocious. Just two inches of mulch. Uh, if you're out there in July and it's midday and you feel the top of the mulch, it's going to feel pretty hot. If you've got two inches of mulch there, you slip your hand down underneath that two inches and touch the top of the soil. It's amazing how cool that it'll feel with just two inches of mulch insulating the top. Uh, the top of the tree that's taken in the sun, it's adapted to heat. The, the roots would prefer cool. They don't want to feel like they're being uh, in scalding soil. So, and also if you do have any weeds or whatever come up in that soil, by having mulch there, it keeps it soft. The, root, the weeds are easy to pull. <clears throat> and the other big thing that it does with uh, so much clay in our soil, uh, if you don't have mulch on top of it, it's going to dry and become crusty. It, the movement of air and water and fertilizer is going to be greatly impaired. If you have mulch on top of it, that soil surface never dries out. And over time, as the mulch kind of breaks down, there'll be a layer there between the soil and the mulch that uh, is going to be kind of like the texture of a sponge. <clears throat> If it never dries out, it remains permeable. So when you when you water, the water penetrates. If you fertilize, you know, use root stimulator or whatever, it's going to um, uh, penetrate easily. In fact, that's one of the one of the ingredients in the root stimulator. There's a a non-nutritive, I think it's an organic little ingredient there in there that's a uh, penetrant, and that means when you pour it onto stuff like that, uh, if something were dry, water tends to beat up and roll off. Well, it's got a little ingredient there to counteract that to where it will actually um, soak in readily. Okay. And let's see. I've got my notes. There are a lot of things. So I'm trying to follow. Uh, okay. Typically, when you plant a tree, uh, you're not going to need to trim it. Uh, the only thing I do is, uh, if you were to see a little branch here or there that is dead, you know, it's crispy, uh, or it got broken in transport or whatever, uh, you can just take your little pruners and take that guy out if it's a... Uh, or see this guy here, he's dead. Uh, these other limbs, 
they went on to thrive and live, and he, he got out competed. So you just take him out, get him out of the way. But as far as pruning it back or things like that to compensate for planting, you know, don't do that. And if it's a uh, bigger shade tree, say like a uh, red oak or Chinese pistache or whatever, or basically, you know, any of the trees, especially shade trees, though, if um, they've got branches, let's say that I'm the tree trunk, and they've got branches that are, you know, down at four feet or five feet, you know, that are in the way of you walking around it, I would want to leave those for three years would probably be best because what those guys are doing, if they've got leaves on them, they're contributing. They're making food and helping the rest of the tree grow. But down here, one of the important, really important things that they're doing is the uh, lower limbs are protecting the trunk. You know, the can trees here, like uh, red oak, Chinese pistache, can be subject to sun scald because the sun is so intense. You know, out in nature, when the that came up, you know, if the squirrel planted that that red oak acorn, he's going to probably be planting it, if not necessarily in an outright forest, at least with some stuff around, so the tree is not subjected to, you know, the full uh, power of the sun out there by itself. So uh, in that case, you know, you could wrap it probably the also, you know, that would probably be the first year maybe. And, and basically that's to prevent sun scald. Uh, easy and cheap and it's not going to need to be on there for a very long time. But uh, leave those lower limbs as they grow and leaf out. They'll shelter the trunk. Three years goes by. By the time three years has gone by, the tree has grown enough that, you know, you're probably good to go. You know, that's protecting the trunk, and you can clean up some of the lower limbs. And, of course, while we're talking about uh, pruning up and things like that, if you go on, uh, there's not that much pruning to that's needed, but uh, you might need to do some minor shaping, or if you had... Uh, a limb that was crossing across the center, like on a crepe myrtle, or if you had water shoots on fruit trees, they're, they're coming out and they're shooting straight up. You know, you'd want to uh, prune those out. Uh, water shoots are pretty easy. You know, you're taking the whole thing out. But uh, the other things, say like on a crepe myrtle, you have a limb going through and you're thinking uh, he's not what I would call a contributor. He's kind of off on a, the, the wrong direction and it's a matter of time until he needs to go or just in general shaping um, a good time to do it of course I mean you could do it on a crepe myrtle during the season but uh, when it's dormant the good thing about dormancy is and this is the point I'm getting to you want to know what all is attached to that before you prune it and the easiest and when there's a bunch of foliage that's not easily and uh, not the most uh, traceable thing. When there are no leaves in the way, you grab a hold of a branch and you can follow it all the way up and you know what's attached to it. Of course, that's part of deciding which one needs to go. But I've done it before a few times and it's like, oh, well, I didn't think that through because I, I, I see part of what's attached to it, but I'm not looking close enough and I prune it and then you know, a lot more than that goes away and it's like, oh, wow, well, um, that's, you know, the, the carpenters have the saying, measure, what, twice or three times and cut once. Well, uh, if you're pruning trees, that's the same deal. Once you've cut it, it's like, oop, mess that up. So make sure you know what's all attached to it before you prune it out. Okay, and as far as uh, stake is, staking is concerned, typically that's not needed. Uh, if you were to have a particularly tall uh, and, and well-branched tree, uh, 
possibly it could be needed, but then I'd be talking about probably the first year. You don't want to leave it for any length of time, uh, especially uh, I, I saw a tree a few blocks from here at a business and it had been staked, it was a live oak, it had been staked with T-posts. They were there, the stake wires were there. They were three or four inches into the tree. It had been staked and it had never been removed and the tree was just enveloping all of this stuff. So um, first year, probably gonna do it. After that, the roots have got enough of a hole that uh, they're going to maintain the tree, um, and as I say to people, if you know you can do, uh, you know, prepare for a storm. But you know what? If it's really, really a storm, you know, worry about your house. You know, around here, if you if you look out and the tree's blown over and most of your roof is gone, the tree's a minor thing. So. Uh, um, you can't, you can't prevent, if it's a big enough storm, nothing you can do about it. And the good news is that's a low probability. Okay. And okay. As far as uh, fertilizing, uh, the good news about root stimulator, and you can do that once a month for the first six months or even a year. The good thing about it is it's, um, like I say, stimulates the root development and it's a uh, relatively mild solution and it is a solution. So it's already soluble, so it's easy for the tree to take up. And generally most plants like a little bit of fertilizer relatively often. You know, applying the root stimulator once a month for the first year accomplishes that and, and helps uh, get the roots going on things like that. And uh, when you fertilize, I would go by the same deal as uh, when you're going to plant something, when you're going to fertilize it. When you're going to plant it, you water it first. When you're going to fertilize it, I would water it first. If So that would be a deal like if you're going to fertilize on Saturday, if it hasn't rained like we've had here recently, you know, water it well on Friday. Then you can fertilize it, and then you can water your fertilizer in. Just as a general rule, I don't like to apply fertilizer to something that might really be needing a drink. Give it a good drink first, and then the next day, or at the end of that same day, apply the fertilizer and water it in. Of course, when you put on a granular fertilizer, until you've watered it in, it's not underway. You know, the nitrogen in there is water soluble. So to get it into the soil and down to the roots, you're going to have to water it in. So um, when I apply fertilizer, I'm in, a, I'm in a hurry not to apply it, but for the plant to get it and get going. So watering it in gets it going. And on a trees, that would typically be uh, March, May, and September. Pretty similar to when you're going to be watering your lawn. Because March, or the end of March, typically here uh, for your lawn fertilizer, because you want the grass to be active when you fertilize. Uh, you could do it at the beginning of March for trees, because the uh, uh, good thing is our soil uh, doesn't get cold here. And then uh, May, that's ahead of the summer, and then September, ahead of our what I call our second spring, which is the fall, which is great weather. And um, I mentioned, uh, you know, the very important thing uh, back to when what we started out with, when's the best time to plant a tree, you know, way, way long ago, but when's the best time during the year? Uh, fall is great. Because here, typically, for trees, the stressful part of the year is July, August, September. You know, scalding heat, uh, low temperatures are in the low to mid 80s. Uh, that's a stressful time for trees. The winter here, uh, 
no matter how cold it gets, most of the trees are like, boy, this feels pretty doggone good. They're dormant. Uh, they'll take a lot colder uh, than we ever get. You know, the, about the only big tree that's might be subject to a little damage, uh, and, and rarely so, uh, would be live oak since it's native. But um, the other, and like I say, rarely so, and typically not very much, but uh, the other trees that are deciduous, meaning they lose their leaves in the winter, um, they can take a whole lot more cold than we'll get. You know, a lot of the trees that are here, you know, Baroque, it, it grows from the Gulf, you know, native to Canada. So our winter is not a threat. In fact, um, if we have a pretty cold winter, I think the plants appreciate it because uh, then they know what's going on. If we have one of these winters where it's canceled, the trees are still waiting for the winter to show up. And when it doesn't show up, they kind of are thinking, should I grow now? Should I, is the winter gonna come? Where is it, what's happening? They're confused. If we have a nice cold winter, and then it warms up in March. They know what's going on. It's time to go, and they get going. A lot of times, uh, a lot of the uh, deciduous spring blooming things, spireas and different things like that, uh, are at their prettiest when we've had a cold winter, because the same thing happens. When we have the cold for a while, <clears throat> and then it warms up on schedule, they know it's time to get underway and they, they're above average performance. So, uh, but the, uh, the thing that's neat about it here is our soil not only does not freeze, it doesn't get cold. I've taken a soil thermometer in our flower beds and in our turf areas here. The end of January and middle of February, the coldest temperature I, reading I've ever gotten, like two or three inches down, is uh, 52. If uh, the soil temperature is 40 degrees or warmer, roots are active. So at 52, um, you won't see a whole lot of difference in the tops of the trees, but the roots are underway. And then when July shows up, if you planted it in the fall, the roots have had uh, six months or more head start to get situated before the stressful time shows up. So that's a real boost. And of course, it doesn't just apply to uh, trees. If you plant a, a quart perennial in the fall, the top won't change that much, but its roots are underway. And then when it comes out in March, it started like this, and you have this much, much bigger plant that comes out in March because all through the fall and winter and early spring, the roots were getting situated and basically, the, the top of a plant cannot be more impressive than the root system. You know, that's what makes that happen. So if you give the roots a head start, you're, you're ahead of the game, and your tree or whatever plant it is is going to be more resilient when the heat shows up. And let's see. Okay, I just show, uh, and of course, just another uh, tip if you. Another way, when you're digging the hole, if you wanted to gauge it, uh, let's say this is the, the hole, you're digging with a shovel, you can just lay the shovel across the hole. And that's level. And then with a tape measure, uh, you can, or whatever, yardstick, you can go from the shovel to the bottom of the hole. You know, you don't have to use an empty container. You can just do that. Or what I've done before is I have, you know, some something laying around that I can lay across it, and I just use the handle of the shovel and I see how deep it is, 
and I compare that to the depth of the ball. So more than one way to skin a cat, but the, the key thing is you want to get it at the, the right level in the easiest manner. And uh, be sure to mulch the top. You know, there are, you know, there are, when you read these books, different people have different opinions, but there are some things that they all agree on. You know, mulching the top, getting it at the right level, watering it in well, and I guess the thing I was just about to forget, one of the most important things, I've been talking about planting it. Well, now that we've planted it, we want to maintain it. So what's the biggest maintenance thing? Water. Uh, and see, we just had a summer where we were setting records about between how many days without measurable rain. Well, to me, as a nurseryman, um, that's the bigger concern is, which is even more dramatic is, they're talking about a record this many days without measurable rain. Well, measurable rain is a fifth of an inch. That's measurable. It's a fifth. We just measured it. It's, it's 0 0.20 inches, which is nearly nothing, but it's measurable. But is it functional? It hasn't done anything. You know, it's, it's put a little bit of moisture in the bottom of a gauge, but that doesn't sustain anything. And we're talking about, and the, the record is how many days, 60 days or 70 days or whatever between measurable rain. How long, the, the one that counts for a tree is, how long between um, adequate rain <laughs> or sustaining rain? You know, if it rains three quarters of an inch, an inch or inch and a quarter or whatever, okay, that's a drink. But, you know, this quarter of an inch stuff, that doesn't get past the mulch. So when you look at the number of days between appreciable rain or a functional rain, it's more than 70 days. So um, a newly planted tree, um, it's dependent on you and your sprinkler system is not going to do it because sprinkler systems are great at distributing water and they're great for turf and they're great for, um, well, they can work on trees and shrubs if they're established and they have a big root system out there that can take it in. A newly planted tree doesn't have that. You know, all that water that's distributed, it only has roots right here. And, you know, the, the reality is roots grow everywhere, but they survive where they run into moisture. So if you don't have moisture in here and a root goes out there, if he doesn't have moisture to sustain him, well, that's a dry hole. He's not going anywhere. So uh, we have here, you know, when you get a tree, we've got a care sheet. And down the left column, it shows the size of the tree, like 15 gallon, 30 gallon, 45 gallon. And then there are five distinct time periods. And typically, um, and it has the amount to water. So you've got two things, the frequency and the amount, and both of those are important. It's not just on a whim, uh, but if you go to plant a tree and you've never done a tree before, how much water should you put in there? Your parents didn't teach you this. You didn't learn it in school. Um, you might look on the internet, but that's kind of scary. Uh, so anyway, for instance, on a 30-gallon tree, when you're watering it, it's typically 15 gallons. And that's enough to moisten the root ball and the soil around it and then stop. In our soils, which are heavy and don't let the excess water percolate away, <clears throat> if you were to put 50 gallons instead of 15, and if you turned on your hose full volume, that wouldn't be hard to do at all. You could do that in just minutes and you'd think, man, did I do a good job or what? That tree is watered. Well, you just fill the hole up with water, and that excess water, 
is not going to percolate away very fast. What you're going to be left with, and then a few days down the road, when you do that again, that water, the bottom of the hole is still probably, if not still sitting in some water, it's still really wet. And then you do that again, you're well on your way to drowning your tree. So the, the information that this gives frequency and the amount are both important. So no matter how you're watering your tree, uh, measure it. Because let's say that uh, you get it watered and then uh, two weeks down the road, it leaves are dropping, the top's kind of wilted, and you're thinking, well, I guess I need to water more. Well, more than what? What have you watered up till now? If you haven't measured it, how do you adjust from something that you don't know what you did in the first place? So that's the key thing, because every situation is different. Every year is different. This is a, a, a ballpark. It's a guide. It's not an absolute. Gets you in the neighborhood. Then you factor in the kind of tree you're planting, what the weather's doing, and then you can adjust. But you have to know where you're adjusting from, and that way you can kind of narrow it in to where uh, you're sustaining the tree. And of course, just as, a, as an example of the, boy now, my IQ just went up 20 points when I put on my glasses. Um, for instance, you know, in, in January on a 30 gallon tree, uh, you're going to do 15 gallons once a week. Whereas the same one in uh, June through September, you're going to do that uh, 15 gallons twice a week. So your, your amount doesn't vary that much, but your timing is going to vary. But they're both important. And, okay. And I guess I'm looking through my notes. I think I've got it all covered. Um, if you have any questions, you know, give us a call. And thanks for tuning in. And I think our next presentation is on Saturday at 9. And, uh, and that's going to be on choosing a tree. So we'll, we have a bunch. Thank you.